Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm going to go this way. That's all right. I am Tira with Rent Mason Bees. I think the number one question we're getting asked at the show today, they just stand there and go, rent a bee? They say, no, 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 no. You're not renting bees. You're releasing the bees and you're renting the nesting material that then you send back to us and we harvest and clean. We cleaned over 3 million mason bee cocoons last year and 40 million leafcutter bees. We're the largest solitary bee provider in the country. And so I'm really excited to teach you all about these amazing little pollinators. Um, I did a, a little slideshow with some video. Hopefully it'll work. Um, but you're always welcome to swing by our booth. I have a YouTube channel where I teach. I love to teach. We work with school kids and all of that. So let me walk around and I'll show you a little bit about our presentation. So today we're gonna to talk about your native blue orchard mason bee. This is really important to note because they are from our area. And we're gonna talk about their mason bee that's a spring pollinator and the leaf cutter bee that's your summer pollinator. Now that doesn't really look like a bee, does it? That little mason bee? My daughter used to call it a mermaid bee with a green iridescent sheen. So she'd go out in the garden and look for the mermaid bees. It looks like a housefly. So I want you to take note of that when you see anything emerging in your yard that it does actually look like a, a little housefly. But that is a mason bee, a blue orchard mason bee. So not a lot of people know that 90% of bees are solitary bees, 90%. Well, what does solitary mean? Well, it means what it means. It means that each female lays all its own eggs, finds its own food, and finds its own nest. They don't, um, they don't chew their wood. They have to find natural holes in their habitat. So I wanted to show you a little comparison between a mason bee and a honey bee. So like I said earlier, the blue orchard mason bee is our native pollinator. They're here from our area. And they're remarkable little pollinators because they're native, they fly in the cooler, wetter weather. They have little tiny hairs on their belly called scopa. And what they do is they're clumsy. They're the clumsy little bee that you'll find in your yard and they plop along and they belly flop onto those flowers. They get pollen all over their bodies. 90% of everything they touch gets pollinated. So you can see in that picture there, there's pollen all over its body. Our honeybees, we love them, but they collect it very, very carefully on their legs to take it back to the hive. So they only pollinate 5% of what they land on. So our native species are gonna pollinate your native flora. They're gonna to touch everything in your yard and it's gonna make it grow bigger and stronger. They're amazing little pollinators. Um, they don't have, a, our bees don't have a hive or honey or anything to protect as the honeybees do. So our little bees are super sweet and kind. They don't sting, they're not aggressive. Some, you can watch the videos where you can stand right next to the nesting block and just watch them work and they won't even bother you. They're the sweetest little bees. So these little mason bees will lay about 15 babies in their lifetime and the queens will lay about two, the queen honeybees will lay about 2,000 eggs a day. So a much different life cycle for our little pollinators. Again, they don't chew wood. Their mandibles aren't strong enough to chew wood. They have to find natural holes in your habitat. So woodpecker holes in trees, um, a deck umbrella that has a hole in it. There was a mud plug in my deck umbrella. Um, we get reports back that, you know, you'll see these little bees, they'll find holes in your habitat and they'll just find babies or they'll come back to your nesting block and lay in your nesting block. So they use those mandibles to gather the mud in your yard. So they need to make sure you're not using slug bait in your yard because they're going to take that mud to go make their nests for their little babies. So if anyone's using slug bait, something to learn and take away from today, please don't use slug bait because our little bees will be using that for their nesting chambers. So she's going to crawl into that hole all the way into the back of the hole. She's going to lay a, a mud plug and then she's going to go out in your garden. She's going to collect pollen. She's going to put a little pollen loaf there and then she's going to lay a tiny little egg and then she's going to cap it with mud. So each cell will be a mud, uh, mud baby, mud pollen baby mud and there'll be about five to seven little nesting chambers in each hole. She'll take that nesting chamber, she'll cap it with mud and then in each one there'll be all these little babies. This little baby is going to eat that entire pollen loaf. I have a three-part series on our YouTube channel. I open up the nesting blocks. I show you what your baby bees are doing. I have a little clip here. Let's see if I can get it to work. So this little baby is going to eat all this pollen. If you see in the back of the nesting hole on this video, 
they're really chubby and big because they've been in that block for maybe a couple days longer. As I scroll and I go down to the front, they're teeny tiny bees just kind of hanging onto that pollen, eating that pollen loaf. So it's going to eat that entire pollen loaf and then it's going to become a big chubby bee. When it gets to that state and it's consumed all that pollen, it will then spin a silk cocoon. It'll hibernate in that cocoon all winter long. As it chews through that cocoon and it will emerge as a full grown bee. Then it will only live for about eight to 10 weeks. It'll fly, it'll belly flop and everything, it'll pollinate, enrich everything that it touches. It'll lay babies in your yard, on all your natural holes, or in your nesting block that you've set up for it. At the end of spring, you're not leaving your nesting material out year round. If you're hosting your own bees, it's really important to take that nesting material down at the end of spring. Again, they only live eight to 10 weeks. So when you don't see any more mason bee activity, you're going to remove that nesting material and then store it in a cool garage or shed. For those that want to scan the QR code, it'll take you right to a video on how to safely store them over summer. Um, or just again, I know I'll reference it, but the YouTube channel, we put everything up on there. So you're going to just store them safely over summer and then you're going to do your cleaning of your bees. So you're wanting to use nesting material that, does, that you can open and clean at the end of their season because you need to provide them with clean nesting material at the beginning of each spring. So bamboo, you can't clean that. You can't open that easily to clean. And holes, or logs with holes drilled in it, which is kind of the old school way of doing things, really, really bad for our little solitary bees. You can never open a log with holes drilled in it. And I'm gonna teach you a little bit about what you're gonna find inside your nesting chambers and why it's so important. If you take away one thing today, you've gotta to clean your nesting material and you've gotta take care of our solitary bees. Our honey bees need maintenance and care. Same thing with our solitary bees. So we partner with a lot of different um, scientists and research teams across the country studying the predators that harm our solitary bees. So some of the next slides I'm going to show you are from their scientific discoveries, their microscop microscopic pictures of different things. But we're, we want to help our solitary bee populations. Being that they're a native species, they're very important to us. It's really, really important that we're learning more about how to care for them. So what I'm teaching you today is what we've learned through science. We've been doing this. Um, our owner, Jim Watts, has been doing this. He took over the business from his dad. Give away his age, but a long time. Over, over 80 years, he's in the back. Um, he's not 80, but he took, he's been taking, he took over the business. So we know what we're doing when we're talking about our little solitary bees. And that's why I'm really excited you're all here to learn how to care for them. So pollen mites. Pollen mites are a really bad little mite that gets into their nesting blocks. And let's see if I can stand over here. Well, so in the cell here, if you can see the um, nesting chamber right here, you'll see the pollen mites are in the nesting chamber. Right above that is a very clean and healthy cocoon. That little mason bee, if you don't clean this nesting block, that cocoon will emerge with a, a full-grown bee in the springtime. It'll crawl through the pollen mites. All the pollen mites will stick on the back of the bee. And then that little bee is going to spread pollen mites all over your flowers and your garden on everything it touches. That's then going to get all over your honeybees, your bumblebees, and everything else that they're going to harm. You can see how they multiply significantly. On the videos on YouTube and the, the, the scientists, they send them back, you can see them moving. If you put them on a piece of paper, they're going to spread out. They multiply really rapidly. So we want to make sure that we're not having them crawl through those pollen mites to then spread in your yard. Chalk brood is a fungus. It's a fungal spore that the little mama mason bee will collect on a flower, on a pollen, and she'll put it back into that nesting chamber and she'll leave that pollen loaf. Well, that little baby will ingest that, the spores of the fungus. It dries that baby up and then those spores burst into hundreds of spores that now the baby's going to crawl through and then get on its body, spread in your garden, and then harm. This particular chalk brood fungus disease harms mason bees, leafcutter bees, and honeybees. So again, you know, need to make sure you're getting rid of all of that in your nesting material. Houdini fly. These little suckers um, wait for the mama mason bee to leave, and then it will wait outside the nesting block. It'll fly in, it will lay its babies. Mama mason bee doesn't know that. She'll cap it with mud. And then inside that cell will be about 30 or 40 of her little babies. 
Now, when do you think the pollen mites, the chalk brood, and the Houdini fly emerge again? In spring with the mason bees. So you can see the ratio from predators to bees. You're actually, if you're not cleaning your nesting blocks and you're leaving it out year round, you're actually now creating a predator habitat. So it's really important to make sure you're harvesting and cleaning and taking it down at the end of spring. The summer predators would be like a mono wasp, and you'll see it too in your garden. You have a lot of wasps in the summertime. It's warmer then. So this is a mono wasp, and it, it looks for, its only way of surviving is to find a cocoon to poke its ovipositor in. So it hunts down mason bees. She'll take that ovipositor, she'll stick it in the cocoon, lay all her babies, and again, it will kill your mason bee. So this is why it's really important to harvest and clean, to take care of your solitary bees, provide new nesting material at the beginning of each spring, and just taking care of our little pollinators. So the best type of nesting material are the stacking trays that you can easily pull apart and then, and then sterilize and clean and then put back together, or the cardboard tubes that you can unravel and clean at the end of the season. Um, we did a video recently, well I did it last season when we were setting out early spring. If you have a nesting block that you've never cleaned, it has mud plugs on it, there's probably baby bees inside. So you can scan this QR code or you can go visit our website. There's a technique that we do with material that um, sometimes people just bring us their logs with holes in it and these bamboo reeds are like, what are we gonna do with it? So there's a little technique that you can do right before springtime, you wanna set it up with healthy nesting material nearby. You're gonna take your log with holes drilled in it, you're gonna tip it up upright with the holes, sprinkle sawdust on it, when those little bees emerge, the holes will fill up with sawdust and then you're gonna dispose of that nesting material. But you're gonna save the baby bees inside. They might have pollen mites, they might have chalk brood, but we don't want them to go back into that nesting material. So we did a whole video on that that you can watch to learn about that. And then you're gonna to wanna to harvest and clean. So for those in the audience that raise their own um, mason bees and clean them and take care of them, um, that's wonderful. We love supporting you, we have videos on all that. Um, if you're not wanting to do all the cleaning and maintenance, that's the rental part of our program, where you're just sending those nesting blocks back to us once they spin that silk cocoon and they're safe to send, and then we do all the harvesting and cleaning for you. So you're, if you're doing it yourself, we use one cup of water to 20 gallons of water. I mean, we did three million bees. It's a huge process. So we do, you want to wash them in a mild bleach solution. It doesn't hurt the cocoons. They are um, waterproof and hardy, but you're going to remove any extra pollen mites. Um, you're going to remove any um, other Houdini fly. You should see the stuff. Our process is all outside. It's quite, quite impressive. Um, and then you're going to take all the clean cocoons. You're going to wash them and rinse them, and then you put them on a light board. You candle them or a flashlight. Um, you pick out the non-viable cocoons. If they glow, grow, glow a little amber, that means there's nothing viable. So we literally pick through. This is when we have our volunteers come and help. We pick through three million mason bees cocoons to make sure that you're only putting out clean, healthy bees the following season. The fire, there's no bees in there. Don't want to freak people out. <laughs> That's after we've taken them out of the, the, um, the blocks. But we flame them to kill the pollen mites and the chalk brood that's left over. That's the only way. So if you have your own nesting blocks at home, you can flame them. Um, or if you have the tubes, you're not using those again, you're disposing of them and putting fresh material out. Then you're gonna wanna store them in your fridge at 39 degrees with a 65% humidity. We have a giant refrigerator. You walk in and we have our bees all in there. It's pretty cool. Kids love mason bees. They don't sting, they're super friendly little bees, and again, you can have them go look for those mermaid bees in your garden. We have free printable workbooks and worksheets on our website. Grandparents send them as gifts to people because they want their kids to learn more about pollinators. So you can visit our website to print up all those, um, um, all the worksheets that we have. Um, you can have the kids hold a baby bee, which is just a bee in a cocoon. We have some in our booth and that's the thing, you wanna hold a baby bee and they're like, it's a cocoon, it's okay, they're like a butterfly, they hibernate all winter long in that cocoon and then they emerge. So they're totally safe and the kids love to hang out with the little bees. So I wanna talk a little bit about leaf cutter bees, see what my timing is. Oh, oh I can really talk slow. Um, <laughs> um, so leaf cutter bees are your summer pollinators. So again, you're not gonna keep that mason bee block out all uh, uh, summer long, you're taking that block down and then you're gonna swap the block and you're gonna put your leaf cutter block back. We do both mason and leaf cutter bees. 
Um, so these are the teeny tiny little bees. I, have, I just did a video when we were cleaning our, our blocks and they're about the size of your little pinky, so they're teeny, teeny, tiny bees. Um, they emerge when temperatures are 75 degrees, but they have a much different life cycle than the mason bees. Those mason bees are hibernating in that cocoon all winter long and they emerge as a full grown bee. Leaf cutter bees hibernate in the larvae state during winter time. So when you put their nesting block out, those little bees aren't gonna perk up until the temperatures reach about 75. I'm like, oh, cool, it's time for me to get going. Then it will eat the pollen, and then it will emerge about four to five weeks later. So they have a much different lifespan than the mason bees. So when you, people get their mason bees, boom, they're out right away. The boys come out first and the girls come out later. Leaf cutter bees are a little bit different. They also are super friendly and don't sting, and they are belly floppers as well. So this little bee is going to chew out of this, uh, his little nesting block. And I got this macro lens. Their eyes are unbelievable. They are the cutest, sweetest little bees. So this little bee is chewing his way out. And then he will uh, emerge and he'll pollinate and enrich your habitat. Just like your little mason bees, they're going to belly flop and, and um, take care of your yard. Um, and you can see on this picture, I love this picture because remember I was talking about the scopa on the mason bees. Same thing, solitary bees have that scopa on their belly. You can see how he's complete, he or she, are completely covered in pollen. Again, remarkable pollinators. This little, oh, and they'll um, pollinate your vegetable gardens and anything blooming in the summertime. So you have veggies, you have summer blooms, you're gonna want leaf cutter bees. They're gonna help you have, grow more food. Um, they use tiny little pieces of leaves. They're not gonna hurt your plants. They like rose bushes, so those that want those beautiful rose, but they just take these tiny, they're so tiny, they take these little tiny half circles. They do like rose bushes, but they sometimes use petals of flowers in your yard. Let's see if this video will work. I have them flying, there we go. So they're gonna fly into that little hole, gonna crawl all the way back with that little tiny piece of leaf, and it's gonna go in that hole, and it's gonna chew it and make it really pliable and it'll chew it up and then lay it around this outside of the, the hole. And then it'll go back out and get a few more leaves and do it again. She'll lay a pollen and then a little tiny egg and then get more leaves and wrap it up again. It takes her about three to four hours to make each leaf sleeping bag. And then they make beautiful art. This is a leaf cutter cell. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's so, <laughs> my team knows that when they're um, harvesting uh, blocks and stuff and they find something really beautiful, they save it for me because I want to show you guys what they look like. It's artwork. It's absolutely beautiful. So this is, these are leaf cutter cells. So this little one used green leaves and then this one used pink flowers and then we found one that was husky color. Sorry if you're a Wazoo fan, but we had some husky color uh, leaf cutter bees make up some beautiful nest cells. We, um, you, if you break them apart, there are these tiny little leaf cells in each side. Each one of those is a little leaf sleeping bag. So they're amazing little constructions. They only live for six to eight weeks and they uh, will lay about 20 eggs in their lifetime, little babies. They saved our alfalfa crops. Uh, farmers were having difficulty years ago, decades ago. Um, growing alfalfa and they introduce leaf cutter bees to their crops. Well that purple flower there has a pistol that shoots off so pollinators that try to pollinate it, it flicks and it scares them off. Well these little bees are so, leaf cutter bees are so small they can get right into that flower and pollinate it and they brought back our alfalfa crops. They're amazing. So now farmers in alfalfa crops that's all they use are leaf cutter bees. We also do the harvest, like I mentioned earlier, we did 40 million leaf cutter bees. Um, we, um, we don't put them through a machine, we have to hand do all our leaf cutters. We have this tool that we scrape it out very carefully and then these are the little leaf cutter cells. You can see some of them are smaller, that's an actual cell in there of a little baby. So how can you create a healthy habitat? I've mentioned a few of it, but I just wanna reiterate. Food. So your mason bees need early spring blooms. A lot of people ask right now, well, what should I plant in my garden? This is the time of year, or you're here at the Flower and Garden Show, to go to your garden nursery and ask what's blooming in early spring. Um, I love it when people plant early spring blooms in your yard because not only are you helping the mason bees, but you have the bumblebees and you have other spring pollinators that really rely on the food in your yard. 
um, you're going to want to place your nesting block in the south facing morning sun. So grab your coffee in the morning, go outside and go, hmm, sun, I'll put my block there. Early morning sun. It doesn't need to be all day long, it just needs to have that morning sun. Our, our houses are painted black to warm them up from the sun. They need to, the temperatures, they, they'll emerge at 55 degrees. We get asked this a lot. It doesn't need to be 55 in the nighttime either. They will crawl into that hole. I did a video, where do baby bees sleep at night? And I took a flashlight out in the, at nighttime and inside I looked and there were these green iridescent bums, these bee bums. And so they'll go in there and they just flutter. They, sell, they generate their own heat. So you don't need to worry about your temperatures being 55 all the time. It can drop because you're early spring. We're still warming up. So that you need that morning sun to perk them up in the morning. Nesting material, again, the kind that you can clean every fall. And they need a mud source. So you're going to want to get clean mud. Again, don't use slug bait or anything that's going to harm your mud source. And you're going to want to put your mud hole about 10 to 15 feet from where they emerge. Give them easy access to mud, because as you saw, they have to use that mud to make their nesting chambers. Um, and then you definitely want to clean them every fall and not use pesticides. We want to make sure you have a pollinator-friendly yard. So if you're following these steps, you're going to create a really great habitat for your solitary bees. Not a lot of people know that dandelions are a bee's first food, or a moth, or anything that is um, emerging in early spring. Uh, in the Midwest, there's a whole campaign of no mow May. I wish we could start it here. I my coworkers and I were trying to figure out a way of getting this trend going. But you need to have these flowers around um, and don't, oh, I cringe when I walk through this, the store and there's um, weed killer and all of that. If you're using weed killer on any of your dandelions, it seeps into the ground, it kills the bees that land on them, it kills the little babies. I mean, it's just, so please don't use weed killer. There's these really cool tools. Friskar has one where you just pu push it in the ground and it pops up the weeds and it's kind of fun. So you just kind of walk around your yard or hand pull your weeds. But please don't use weed killer. It really harms all our pollinators. And keep those dandelions out for a little bit if you can. Um, I have this slide in our booth because everyone's asking us about um, having their own mason bees and you saw some of the, the slides that I shared earlier. Um, but it is a haunted bee house. I did this thing in, in uh, Halloween time where we had a haunted bee house. And if you're not cleaning and you're having a predator habitat, your, your bee block is going to be taken over by predators. It'll be a haunting ground of predators. So we want to make sure to eliminate all of your little um, predators. The other thing you can do is release more bees. So these are your native bee species. The more we release, you're helping your solitary bee populations. If you're hosting your own bees, thank you. Keep cleaning them, keep taking care of them, keep ma maintaining them. Um, these are our, some of our nesting blocks that, that you can see. The white tube is our emergence tube. Um, we have bees in our booth you can come and see, but you're going to want to, there's a piece of tape over that white hole. You're going to take the tape off, set the tube up, that's it. That's how these, that's, they're so easy to take care of. I like to watch them, so we put them about four to five feet. Cindy um, is one of our hosts um, that gets them every year for her neighborhood, and she has like a planter box that with a post and our bees, and then we, she has a pollinators at work sign, and she loves teaching the kids about bees. And so that's another way that you can do your post. Um, we were featured in Mother Earth News. The video that didn't work was this little bee, um, is a famous bee now because he was in Mother Earth News and Birds in Bloom magazine. He's kind of our feature bee. Um, we were so excited that our solitary bees are finally getting the attention they deserve, even though they used a honeybee on the cover of the magazine. But I wasn't going to correct them because I got it in the mail. I'm like, woohoo! I'm like, that's a honeybee. So, but it's okay. There was a whole spread on our solitary bees. Um, but that little bee is our little famous bee. Oh, and I didn't mention when they emerge, the boys emerge first. See that little white tuft of hair on his head? That's a boy. They have this little white beard looking thing. And so they emerge first and then the girls come out um, a week or two later. So you can pollinate your yard with um, solitary bees. Um, again, they're incredible little pollinators. They belly flop. They are gentle, stingless little bees. And you can get a starter kit where we have them now available today. You'd take home your bees today. You'd put them in the fridge because it's not springtime yet. You're just going to, they're on ice right now. We came, they came from our big walk-in fridge to the show. We have them on ice, so they're just chilled right now. They're chilling. Um, and then you'll um, put them out in the springtime. 
and you can come visit us. We are in booth 507. We have pollinator uh, kits that have mason and leafcutter bees, um, or just the mason bee kit or the leafcutter, whatever you choose. And I want to show you one last video. I want to show you our tribute to mason bee videos. I got all these bees in slow motion. And I want you to notice on some of these pictures, some of them are completely covered in pollen. You can see their little bellies. They're my favorite, don't tell the leaf cutters. I love the mason bees so much. They're just these little tubby bees that just fly around. <laughs> they little goosebumps right now, they're so cute. <laughs> there he goes, he's all covered in pollen. That's a girl, she doesn't have a tuff of hair. You can stand right next to your block and watch them work. They won't bother you at all. See this one covered in pollen? Going in. Drying off, warming up in the sunshine. I got this little bee on a leaf, giving himself a bee bath. So each female will pick her own cell. This is a tote that we set out in a, in a field when we released 1,600 bees. So that's why there's so many. Your garden won't have that many. Well, unless you wanted a tote, but it's a lot of bees. There you go, covered in pollen. See the little three dots on its head? Those are its eyes, a couple of his eyes. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> It's covered in pollen. <laughs> Look at this one. This is making a mud. He's, she or he is, or she is plugging it with mud. I did it in slow motion and I was able to get him spitting the mud out and sealing off its little hole. Covered in pollen again. Each female will take her own hole. They don't fight with each other, but solitary. She's, each female's laying all her own eggs. There's the green bee bum. See, at night you can go look in your block and see if you see any bee bums. <laughs> so there you go. There's solitary bees. So <laughs> if you have any questions, please stop by our booth. Check out our YouTube channel.